Side Hustle Show 220, SEO for bloggers, how to get more free traffic to your website. If you want to start a blog of your own, check out my free video series at blogstartercourse.com. I'll show you step-by-step how blogs make money and how to get your site online for less than you might think. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where aspiring part-time entrepreneurs learn how to turn their side hustle dreams into reality. Because your nine to five may make you a living, but your five to nine makes you alive. And now your host, Nick Loper. What's up, what's up, Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show, where it's all about ideas, action, and results. Today, you're gonna learn how to make someone fall in love with you if that someone is Google. Yes, it's all about getting more free search engine traffic to your website, to your blog, to your online business. And to help me figure this stuff out, I invited my friend Joseph Hogue on the show. Joseph is a Marine Corps veteran. He's a former investment analyst. He's an author, a blogger, a freelancer, and really an all-around super smart dude. We met through FinCon and it hit it off right away, in part, I think, because we had the exact same haircut. He runs several blogs, including MyWorkFromHomeMoney.com and PureFinance101.com. His latest book is Google SEO for Bloggers, Easy Search Engine Optimization, and Website Marketing for Google Love. Stay tuned to hear Joseph's quick and dirty keyword research process. It's going to keep you from wasting time writing articles no one will ever see and some of his favorite link building methods to get more traffic and Google juice to your pages. Notes, links, and a free PDF highlight reel from this conversation are at sidehustlenation.com slash Joseph. Lots of detailed stuff inside, but for now, just enjoy because you can always grab these highlights and tactics at sidehustlenation.com slash Joseph. Before we dive in, let me take a moment to thank today's sponsor, FreshBooks.com. The all-new FreshBooks is transforming how freelancers, side hustlers, and small business owners deal with their day-to-day paperwork. The award-winning cloud accounting software has been redesigned from the ground up and custom-built for exactly the way we work. Visit freshbooks.com slash sidehustle to start your 30-day free trial today. I'll be back to tell you a little bit more about what's new with FreshBooks, plus my top takeaways from the chat with Joe after the interview. Ready? Let's do it. I learned early on in blogging and business and basically whatever you do, that there's always one thing that everybody in your industry, all your peers, everyone else running a business is just avoiding because it's, you know, they either don't want to deal with people or they think it's difficult or whatever. And so if you go after that part of the business, that part that everyone else avoids and master it, then you're, you'll be successful. You've got a competitive advantage. And in blogging, it's just very clearly search engine optimization. A lot of bloggers, they think that it's too technical or that it costs too much money or, or they just don't want to try to learn it. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I went after SEO from an early start on my blogs and okay. it's, it's helped them grow so, so quickly in just two years. That's uh, that's awesome. I'm probably guilty of being that person who's like, very rarely do I write a post where I'm like thinking about SEO. I mean, it's some of it is innate. Like if this is the keyword that I'm targeting, of course, I'm going to put that in my title. But, you know, I don't do a ton of homework outside of that to look at volume, unless it's like a super article I'm really putting a lot of time in. If you've got a blog and you look at your stats, your analytics, and you're probably going to see that a good chunk of your visitors are from Google. I mean, mine, it's it's between 50 and, and 70% of my traffic is just from Google search. So, mine is too. you know, if you're not targeting that point, then you're just scratching the surface of what you could do. I mean, I, I know a lot of people do really well on Pinterest or Facebook or social media or whatever, but they're just not getting the kind of traffic and the numbers that they could. And that's important. And it really all starts with keywords. Fair enough. Now I'm looking at my analytics, uh, 55% from organic search in the last 30 days. So yeah, definitely a the, sure. b- definitely the biggest chunk of the pie. Yeah. And how much time do you spend on social media trying to get traffic or uh, how much money do you spend on social media management tools or other tools just focused at getting other traffic while kind of completely ignoring Google SEO? It's a big problem with a lot of bloggers I know. All right. Now I'm feeling guilty. Okay. So what should I do? <laughs> what, take me to the promised land. What should I do before I hit publish on, on a new post? All right. Well, you know, it, it all starts with a process and surprisingly, it's an easy process to get started in, in SEO, just kind of doing the basics that you need to do. And it's going to put you out ahead. Like I said, it starts with keywords. Google has gotten really smart about what keyword your article is about, your, your main topic. But if you're leaving it up to Google, you aren't going to rank for for those high volume buyer intent searches and a lot of the the importance there is buyer intent you know everybody goes through 
the awareness, what is it? Uh, the, that old marketing acronym, awareness, interest, decision, and action, right? So a lot of your high volume keywords, they might just be people searching for an idea, awareness, or information about something, but they're not necessarily close to that buying decision. Well, when you do some keyword research and actually find high volume keywords that you can compete for, that you can actually rank for, but that are also for people searching for those action keywords like comparisons, reviews, anything that signifies that they're close to make a buying decision. I mean, that's the really going to lead to the traffic that you want. Oh, okay. Okay. So this is like when I had the shoe business, people would always say, well, so if I Google shoes, am I going to find your site? I'm like, absolutely not. You're never going to see me for, <laughs> for something like that broad. But if you search for like a very specific model of shoes, yeah, yeah I hope you find me. So it kind of goes trying to target keywords that can signify people a little bit farther down their buying funnel. But even like, what if you don't have a e-commerce store? It's just a blog. Sure. Sure. Well, you've got, I mean, hopefully you've got something that you're trying to sell whether it be affiliates, your book, any way you make money, then that's the keywords that you need to be ranking for. You need to be driving people from Google search to, to those posts. Okay. So do you, would you publish a post that like has no monetization angle? Like this is purely like a, a brand building post. This is purely just like a content driven piece of, uh, piece of information I'm putting out <laughs> into the world. I would have to be really pressed, you know, and there, there are, times when you want to do those brand building posts and even even times when you want to go for that search traffic that is starting on the the buyer intent so so people just looking for information if you can get those people into your sales funnel you can get them on your email list or uh, just get them comfortable and aware of your website then eventually when they're ready to make a purchase then you've already got that confirmation there but it's always on a keyword process or keyword research process. I mean, I'm not going to just write an article that isn't focused on one keyword idea that I think I can rank for and that can bring me traffic, whether it's, it's a high buyer intent target or not. Because if you're just writing a post without any idea of how much traffic it might get you, then why are you writing it? <laughs> it might bring you one person, which my mom will read it, I'm sure. But if it's not bringing me at least a few hundred people a month, then is it really worth your time? My whole keyword research process takes maybe 10, 15 minutes at the most. Okay. For the next few minutes, Joe's going to walk us through his keyword research process, which is broken down into three steps. First, you're going to come up with a big list of potential keywords to target in your post and probably dump those into a Google spreadsheet to keep track of them. Second, the idea is to estimate the search volume of those keywords and really eliminate the ones that no one is looking for. And he gives the criteria of a minimum of 500 searches per month using the Google Keyword Planner. Finally, you're trying to determine how likely it is you're going to be able to rank for that narrow down list of potential keywords, looking at the current search results landscape in Google, and then ultimately picking the one or two you're going to go for in your post. It might sound like a lot of work, but once you get the hang of it, it should only take 10 to 15 minutes per post, like you said, and should start to become second nature. You're, you're just starting out brainstorming. You're starting out with, okay, what do I want this post to be about? What do I want people to do while they're reading or, or after they're reading the post? And, and you brainstorm maybe five to 10 good keyword ideas, keyword phrases, you know, probably two, maybe three, three words long to get those good long tail keywords. And then you just start, uh, you just start working through the process. You, you go to two tools that I really like is Google suggest and, uh, and then related searches. Basically when you're searching on Google, you start typing in a, a word, you start typing in these, these five or 10 keyword ideas that, that you just came up with. And it's going to start suggesting stuff The drop down the search box in, in Google is just going to drop down and, and start suggesting searches. And these are all based off of really popular searches that other people have. So a lot of times that's going to give you ideas of, of things that you might be able to target for a keyword. Okay. And then when you actually do search for something, then you scroll down to the bottom of the page and there's always related searches to this keyword. So that's a, another good five or six ideas usually. Okay. What do you do with those? This is all going into a list. Okay. A lot of the process is the first part of the process is just getting ideas because a lot of times you've got an idea for a keyword or if you're talking about real estate investing in a post, okay, so real estate investing is an idea. Now, just off the top of my head, I know there's no way I'm ever going to rank for that because I'm not the Huffington Post or Forbes, 
So I probably need other ideas. So I'll brainstorm those five to 10 ideas and I'll go over and get some more ideas from suggested search and related search. Another really cool tool for keyword research is called Suvel. It's a website, S-O-O-V-L-E. And it's basically just a suggested search tool that pulls from multiple search engines. So like Bing, Yahoo, Amazon, YouTube, Google, you, you type in in their search box and it'll populate with all the suggested searches from each of those websites, oh, okay. from each of those search engines. So it's a really quick, quick way to get a lot of suggested search keyword ideas to add to your list. And you're just adding to your list right now. You're just finding different ideas that you might be able to target. Have you written your 500,000 words at this point? Or you're like, I haven't even started yet. A lot of times I'll, I'll do, I'll do kind of a reverse engineering on it. I'll write my post, kind of see what, what comes up naturally. So that'll start my keyword research brainstorming. So you'll have your, your list that's really works out naturally. And then while you're, while you're kind of researching these ideas and getting some other, other suggested keywords, then uh, you can say, okay, well, yeah, that's, that can work in here. That can work in here. That doesn't really work so much. Okay. Fair enough. Now you're dumping these into like the AdWords keyword planner to get an estimate of, of monthly mm -hmm. volume. Yep. Once you've got all that done, I mean, you're going to have, you're going to have upwards of, of a hundred keyword ideas, Jeez. really good, good keyword ideas that you can take. You go to keyword, the Google keyword planner, you open up the search suggestion. And I think it's, get keyword volume is the box you put it, you just paste all those in there. Okay. And it's going to give you the monthly search volume, what's called a keyword competition, and then a suggested bid. Now, what's important here is this keyword competition suggested bid. These aren't necessarily how hard it is to rank for the keyword. This is the relative number of people that are bidding on that keyword. So what you can do is by sorting through for that keyword competition, which goes from 1.0, which is super competitive to zero. And then the suggested bid is a price by sorting through those, you can kind of back into buyer intent keywords. Okay. Because why would a whole bunch of people be bidding on that keyword and paying a lot of money for AdWords if it wasn't a high buyer intent or a good conversion keyword? Okay. Okay. Yeah. You got to remember AdWords is, is first and foremost an advertiser tool, but we're using yeah. it here for SEO. Yeah. You can back into uh, to some, some great keywords that are really far along in that buying cycle. Okay. Well, if it's, if it's competitive for advertisers, it's likely to be competitive for SEO too, right though? It's probably going to be competitive. Sure. You get your list there. You get all the monthly searches for each of your keyword ideas. You know, I'll usually delete anything with anything less than maybe 500 monthly searches, right? Okay. That's like too, too small to worry about. Sure. Okay. Sure. So you, you've got your list. Maybe, maybe you've got it down to 15, 20 keyword ideas that you want to look at. Then there's a really cool tool for figuring out if you can actually rank for it. You know, right? Because <laughs> that's the important hey, part. <laughs> it's fifty thousand monthly searches, and I'd love to rank for it, but it's just not going to happen. So, if you're using Chrome as your internet browser, then you can get what's called the Mozbar extension, M O Z B A R. Okay. Developed by you know by the Moz company, which is kind of the leaders in SEO. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is when you search Google using this Mozbar extension. Basically, you just turn it on and it automatically runs when you're searching. Then it's going to show a little black bar under every search result. And in that black bar, it's going to show you three things. It's going to show you the links to that page. It's going to show you the page authority. And it's going to show you the uh, domain authority. Like the, num the number of links that that page has. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The number of links that, that Moz has found linking back to that page. I always called it Moz. Is it Moz? I, maybe it is Moz. I don't <laughs> I guess I've never, you know, I, I watch Rand's Blackboard Friday, Friday Blackboard, whatever yeah. he does every week. But I, I read the, I read the transcript. I never watch the videos. <laughs> so maybe he's, maybe it is Moz. I don't, I don't know. know. I guess I have no, no audio cue into that. Either way, the M-O-Z bar. Okay. The Moz bar, or the Moz bar. And basically, okay, so this page authority and domain authority are two measures developed by Moz that really basically follow the same ranking factors as Google does. You know, they look at how many links they have coming into your site and a bunch of other factors. So it's a really good measure of, you know, how, how authoritative your, your page is in the eyes of Google. Okay. And what's important here is Google ranks pages, right? Not websites. Whenever you do a search, you're finding pages. You're, you're not usually finding the homepage for a site. So if you look at that page authority and then the number of links for each of those 
five, maybe top 10, uh, those first page results when you're searching on Google, then that's going to give you a good, really good idea of whether you have a chance of ranking for that keyword or not. So you go through your maybe 10, 15 really good high volume keyword ideas that you want to chart, maybe, maybe target one of them for your post. And you're really looking for an average of those top five, maybe those top 10. And you're really looking for an average page authority between 25 and 35. You know, most blogs are going to find it fairly easy to rank for rank a page with their page authority between those those two numbers, between 25 and 35. This is a scale that goes from like one to 100. Yeah, it's like one to 100. You'll see sites like Forbes and Huffington Post and Wikipedia will all have domain authorities in the 90s or whatever. And most of their pages will have page authority of like in the 60s and 70s. Okay, geez. Okay, so so yeah, you're never going to rank for those keywords. If the first 10 results all have page authority in the 60s and 70s, okay. don't even bother. Okay, but if it's a little bit lower, if it's like in this 25 to 35, that's kind of like the sweet spot. Okay, I'm, I might have a chance to crack the top yeah. 10 on this one. Yeah, you know, at this point, if it's if it's a good high volume keyword, maybe a, a few thousand searches or, you know, up to 5,000 searches a month, you find one that's that's right in this sweet spot, then you're calling home to your mother because this is, this is golden, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. You know, this is, this is going to make you tons of money and you're going to retire just on this one keyword basically. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's really where you start. You know, you, you've got to be looking at finding a keyword that you can rank for, which is the end result. One that has good buyer intent that you think, you know, people, if they do make it to your site, might have a chance of actually buying what you're selling. And that, you know, you've got a few people that are that are going there. You've got a decent volume because without each one of those three, if, if one of those three falls through, then what are you getting? OK, so the three were buyer, buyer intent, volume, and then your ability to rank. Just the ability to rank. Yep. OK. And then I don't I don't want to spend too much time on the on page SEO. I mean, the most important factors are going to be your header tags and, you know, make sure you have your target keyword as your as the title of your post or at least in the title of your post. All of that stuff, that's, I can kind of consider that the easy part of SEO. But sure. in the book, you really had some interesting tactics on the link building side. So that's one of the primary content plus links, right, is the you know two main components of the algorithm. And you know now we've got this brand new piece of content. We've, we've gone through our keyword research. We figured, hey, I can write super authoritative post on this topic. And now I just need to point a couple links at it to kind yeah. of get Google to notice it and, and get that thing up on first page. So is there a process you follow for this as well? Or is there, you know, depends on the content? No, absolutely. And you're right. You know, on page SEO, it's important to guide Google to the keywords you actually want to rank for. But Google is smart. It knows what the post is about. I feel like, like you said, on page SEO seems like kind of the low hanging fruit that, that everybody does. And where, where you can really distinguish yourself is that off-page SEO, which is basically getting those links as a confirmation, as a confirmation of the quality of your page that tells Google, hey, well, check this out. Yeah. And it's something that, that a lot of people just don't do because there is there is a process to it. There is some work. But being as successful in your in your SEO is just about having just a few off-page techniques that that you like that you use regularly. Some of these really don't even take that much time or, or, or aren't that difficult to do. One of my favorite is, is just infographics. Doesn't get quite as many links as it used to, but my infographics page, my, my pages with infographics get twice as many links on average than other pages. Okay. Among my 10 best articles for search traffic across all six blogs, four have infographics. And that's high considering maybe only one in 10 of my regular posts have infographics. Do you design these things yourself? Like in, what was it? There, there's a ton of them. And and no, I don't. <laughs> I've, I've put together all the infographics I've done. I've put together maybe three of them. And and it's just because, you know, it takes me so long to do and, and I'm not good at it. <laughs> so it's one of those things that I outsource. Okay. Picto chart was the one I was thinking Picto of. Okay. Chart. There you go. Yeah. I, I actually downloaded about a year ago. I downloaded a whole bunch of templates that supposedly you could just do them in uh, in Word and all that. And it was supposed to be so easy. And, and yeah, it, not so much. <laughs> not so much. Okay. So infographics is actually one of those things that you can do really well with Fiverr. There's, there's a bunch of people that provide infographics. Not all of them are great. Most of them aren't, aren't great, but 
you know, it's five bucks. You can try to get a, a few of them done by different people until you find somebody that does a really good job. Okay. They'll all give you unlimited revisions. So basically the idea is just to go to them with a really good idea of what you want to do as far as kind of the structure, the layout. Obviously you have to have all the content written up. So you kind of like would, would take your post and kind of highlight, here are the data points that I would really love for you to include in this infographic. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll write it out. Basically, I'll go to a post, whether it's even an older post, work great for boosting with with infographics because, you know, it's already content's already done. You just got to go back, you you say, "Okay, I want five or six points out of this post." Usually, you know, something to do with numbers work really well, but it's not necessary. Pick five or six points out. You you do an introduction, which is maybe two sentences long. You do a closing point, which is maybe a sentence or two long. And then and a lot of times you can just go to Pinterest, type in your search, your, your topic, and look at what's really performing well there. And that's going to give you a ton of great infographic ideas. So then, you know, you go back to Fiverr, you get a, a few people that are willing to do infographics. There are, they're all going to give you unlimited revisions. So don't be afraid of uh, asking for revisions until, until they get something that, that you're happy with. Okay. And so for five bucks. I mean, I know a lot of people that spend 100, 150, 200 bucks or more on their infographics. Okay. Gosh, it's been, it's been years since I even attempted to make an infographic. What do you do after it's, after it's made? Like you embed that in the post, but like that in itself doesn't get you any links. No, no. Well, I mean, well, okay. There's a couple things. One, you've got to go to, there's a site called Siege Media and there's other sites that do it, but I use this site just called Siege Media, S-E-I-G-E Media. And basically, you can put your infographic structure in there as well as the link and everything. And it's going to automatically generate an embed code for you. Now, you put that embed code when you're in your WordPress editor, you put that embed code under the infographic. And that's just an easy copy and paste code so other people can use your infographic on their site and it automatically gives you a link back. Okay, okay, so, okay, so gotcha. that's going to that's gonna increase the links you get. There's directories. There's a lot of directories and sites that share infographics. Again, for another five bucks, you can get somebody on Fiverr that is going to submit your infographic to 50 or 60 directories. Most of these are going to be kind of worthless no-follow links, but it's still, it's still getting that link profile filled up, still getting some traffic there. And out of those 50 or 60, maybe one or two are follow, do follow links. Maybe some will send some some traffic that way to okay. your infographic traffic that's then going to give you a do follow link from from their post. Okay. Pinterest is obviously a huge source of, of traffic for for infographics. One of my posts with an infographic in it gets thirty five hundred shares on Pinterest. Wow. And about a, a thousand visitors a month just from that infographic on Pinterest. Nice. So it's it's not only you know it's not, it it comes to be not only a, an SEO thing but also a traffic a traffic builder. People are just visual creatures and they, they love infographics. They love any kind of graphic that they can, they can share with other people and, and link to. Okay. Now I got some homework. I've, yeah, now I got you got me excited about doing the infographic thing. What else would you do to build links to that, to that post after hitting publish? Sure. You know, there's different kinds of specific techniques, backlink techniques that you can use. One of my favorite is called broken link building. And it's really one of the best scalable strategies, okay, meaning that you can get a lot of links with less effort compared to some other backlink strategies like guest posting. You know, everybody does guest posting and, and it's great. You get more visitors from guest posting because obviously you're, you're more of a person in that post. Yeah, but it's time consuming. But it's, it takes forever, <laughs> you know, and so I'll, I'll, do, I'll do maybe three or four guest posts for each post that I really want to boost, if I've got a post that I think is going to make me a lot of money from affiliates or, or whatnot, then yeah, I'll write three or four guest posts on other sites about it or about the general topic. And then I'll refer back to that post and get a link. But, you know, as far as building that quantity of links. Okay. So, so slow down on that for a second. So when you're sure. doing guest posting, you're in your author bio or whatever, you're not linking to oh, your no. homepage. You <laughs> no. oh. you say like, oh, come on. Everybody knows that. <laughs> come on, Dick. Really? <laughs> no, no. But I do feel like a lot of people miss the opportunity in guest posting because, okay, one, you know, like I said, okay, Google, Google ranks pages. They don't rank websites, you know? So, so you want every opportunity you can get to rank a page on your site. Any link that's going back to your site is already giving you a link to your homepage just by virtue of having your, your domain in it. 
So why, why miss the opportunity to link to a specific page? Yeah, they've been blowing it for years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, I mean, before I really got active into SEO and really started learning, that's what I was doing. It was all the biographical links with homepage links. And I just look back on it and it's like, you know what, someday I need to contact all those people and try to get that link changed so I can actually get something out of that link. Okay. You know, homepage links are fine, but, but yeah. Okay. And then second on there, whenever you're at a guest post, you want, you want in content links. Google's not stupid. Google knows that all those links at the very end of a post that are just basically guest posts. I mean, that's just somebody trying to manipulate the rankings, you know? So, so it's still a link, it still works, but it just doesn't have that, that juice. What you want are links inside the content of that post. So basically, you know, if you're, if you're going to be writing a guest post to try to boost one particular page on your site, then you want to write that guest post around a topic that's kind of relatable to that post on your site, right? Something that somewhere in that post then you can say, you can talk about the topic that you wrote about on your page. And that'll give you an opportunity to link back to that page within the content. Okay. And it's not being, it's not being spammy because you're actually, you're just giving people more information about that topic. Okay. So my post is like, here are the best Udemy courses for entrepreneurs. Like it's a big money affiliate post. And my supporting guest post would be like, here are the 11 online learning platforms you ought to yeah, know about. Sure. You know, best ways to make money quick, anything where Udemy is going to factor in as an idea within that post. Okay, fair enough. And so, so yeah, you're just referring people back to a post on your site. Hey, I wrote this great post. Check it out because it's got some great information about what I'm talking about. Okay. And that's, those are really the, the kind of links that you want to get through guest posting. To get those 10, maybe 20 links back to an article that are really going to boost it in Google and start those natural linking, because that's what SEO is, is about, right? You, you want to send, you want to start that Google machine going, you want to get ranked on that first page, and then it's just going to take, Google's going to take over for you. You know, yeah. Google's going to have you ranked, it's going to be sending you traffic, and some of those people are just going to naturally leave you links anyway, and it's going to take care of itself. What's the broken link thing, broken link building? Sure. So broken link building, basically, you know, we, we all know that websites come and go. Okay. Some just don't make it. So anyone that is linked to that web page, when it goes down, it's a broken link. It's those annoying 404 pages, right? That you get, you click on a site expecting to go somewhere and it just goes nowhere. It yeah. says, sorry, this page doesn't exist. Right? Well, Google hates that because it's a bad customer experience. Website owners hate it when they have a, a broken link also because it's, it does nothing for the, for the people reading their posts. Yeah. So the idea is to find those pages that have broken links. So find, find a page on SideHustleNation.com that has a link that goes nowhere. I'm sure there are some. And please, please tell me this isn't like a manual process where you're like clicking on hundreds of links. No, there's actually – there are tools that you can use that you can enter like a website name or you can enter a page name. Some of the tools, brokenlinkcheck.com or screamingfrog.co.uk are really good for broken link building. And basically, you know, a lot of times you'll, you'll search for, okay, if, if I've got my real estate investing page, right? Lots of ideas and lots of information on real estate investing. Now I know there's going to be a lot of pages on the internet that are reference pages for that. Somebody does a best of real estate investing or a roundup of real estate investing ideas. Okay. So what I want what I want to do, I want to go to Google and I want to find those pages. So I'll do searches like in URL colon resources and then my keyword. So real estate investing and then those those searches. And basically I just want a list of, you know, maybe 10 or 15 or, or more or 20 websites, web pages that provide 20, 30 links to other references. Obviously, these pages are for the explicit reason, for the explicit idea of linking out to other pages. Oh, okay. Okay. And so you're hoping that one of those happens to be broken and then you can reach out and be like, hey, I noticed you're linking to so-and-so. It's actually a 404 now. Would you mind swapping yeah. it out with my link? Exactly. That's, that's exactly it. Can you tell me that syntax again in URL? Is that in space URL colon resources and then your keyword? No, all of, okay, so you've got a, a bunch of syntaxes that'll work. Insight, so all one word, insight, colon, is going to be anything on that site. Okay, in URL is going to be anything in the, in the URL. 
So in URL, you can also use in title, and these are all one word. So it's I-N-T-I-T-L-E, colon, and then you want to look for resources, links. Anytime somebody's going to write a page, a roundup post, then a lot of times they'll name it links or helpful sources okay, okay. or roundups. Okay. Basically, it's just a quick way to find a lot of these pages that, that are going to have 15 or 20 links on them. That's really the scalable idea. You need to find a bunch of pages quick to find maybe one or two broken links on all of these pages. Okay. Yeah. So that'll bring up whatever the top 10 results in Google for that. You run all those through Screaming Frog or through Broken Link Checker, and that gives you your, your results. That kind of sniffs out the broken links. Okay. Yep. Yep. It's going gonna, it's gonna to point out whatever the broken links are on that page. And then, then you can go to, if you're not sure if that broken link is really something that your reference is, is appropriate for it, because obviously, okay, if you're suggesting that they replace this link with a link back to your post, then you want it to be an appropriate reference. You want it to really be the same kind of information they were trying to, to give their readers in the first place. Right, right. So you can use the, use what's called the Wayback machine, which kind of sniffs out the internet for old copies of web pages that no longer exist. And so that's going to kind of tell you what that page was about, right? Oh, okay. Okay. I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah. So basically you're going to be a little bit, when you, when you actually go and tell that person, Hey, I've got a resource that you can replace that broken link with, then you're not trying to suggest something that has nothing to do with what that page used to be. With what? Okay. Gotcha. So, and then, you know, once you've got that, that the rest is really easy. You're reaching out to the the website owner, you're, you find their contact information, the email address or whatnot from the page, or just use their contact form. And I'll get usually a 10% response rate on my broken link building outreach, which is really good considering some of the other response rates you get from other stuff. So, so imagine, yeah. you know, if you can find a hundred, a hundred broken links, which actually takes no time to do, you get 10 links back to your page just by emailing that person say, Hey, you know, I, I came across your site. I really like this post. It's a lot of really good reference links, but I noticed this one was broken. And I, Hey, I actually just wrote something about that the other day. It's, it's like a help. You're, you're being helpful. You're saying like, Hey, you fix this. I think people have used this on me. And, I, and to me, that's way more effective than the skyscraper technique or people are like, you link to this. I wrote something better. It's like, I, you know, I'm not going to go in and swap out a link just for, just, just for that. Yeah. But if it's, if it's broken, yeah, I better go fix it. Yeah. You have to go back. So yeah, it's not something like, like you said, I, I get those emails five or six a day that, that say, Hey, I just did this infographic. Why don't you share it? Eh, if it's a really great infographic, maybe I will, but there's no really no incentive for me to do anything. Yeah. Whereas broken link building, you know, you've got a broken link. Google hates that. So you've got to go in and fix it. Oh, hey, while I'm there, you know, I don't have to delete that whole sentence or the whole paragraph with the link in it. I can just replace it with this other link. Yeah. So it's it's a really good, really effective way to get links. And, and again, you don't need a lot of links. You need 10, 15 links. You get that from from broken link building and you can rank for those easy 25 to 35 page authority keywords. Okay. Now, Joe, another one of your tactics that I really love is this scholarship contest for your site or sponsored by your site. Can you walk me through how that works? Because I think this is just, this is a beautiful thing. Sure. Yeah. And, and it's one of the few link building ideas that I do that, that actually just kind of work on your domain authority. Just goes straight to the homepage. Yeah. It doesn't really boost any particular page. But the power is just in these .edu links, right? Because Google loves .edu or .gov links. If there's a university or a government website, they're not just linking out to anybody. So if they're linking out to your site, then that's a, a really high confirmation of, of your value. Yeah. And Google loves that. So, you know, a lot of people are, are a little hesitant about giving away 500 bucks or 1000 bucks every year. But, you know, I've got 46 inbound links from to my scholarship page from edu sites just for this this 500 bucks i do every year and it's a, a great way to get content as well so so basically what happens is you just create a new page on your website for an annual scholarship right and you put in there who can win it who's eligible the requirements what they need to do if they need to send in some content like on mine i, I make everybody send in an essay 600 words or more about how their parents taught them about personal finance so not only am I, am I going to get these links that, that we'll talk about, but I'm getting a ton of content. I, I think I got something like 
60 or 70 essays last year wow. that I posted on the site. You know, not, not all of them are great. It's, it's kind of, <laughs> it's a little depressing sometimes the state of the high schooler that some of these essays are, are actually pretty nasty, <laughs> but you get, you get a lot of good ones. You know, I got 20 or 30 really good essays. And then obviously, you know, if you tell them, Hey, the winner of this scholarship is, is chosen by how much social media buzz you create. Well, they're going, they're, they're sharing these things all over social media, all over Facebook, all over Twitter, and you get a ton of traffic on those. Dude. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm loving this. So I could totally, I'm like, you got my gears turning on like, okay, I could do the side hustle scholarship contest. You know, yeah. tell me about your first entrepreneurial venture or, you know, what, what's your dream business yeah. idea or something like that. What have you learned about side hustling or what have you learned from your first job? Stuff like that. Okay. So you, you create this page, this scholarship page, you put you put it in your footer menu, so it doesn't even have to be really intrusive in your in your top menu or anything. Put a put a link to it in your menu, uh, and then you really you're you're going to outreach. So you're you go to Google Google for outside scholarships or private scholarships, and that's going to give you a page, a bunch of pages, usually .edu sites that link out to scholarships, right? Schools that want to give their their students opportunities to get scholarships, they'll link out to other sites that provide scholarships. So what you do is you, you look at each one of these sites that, that provides links and you look for a few commercial sites, a few sites, not necessarily nonprofit organizations giving scholarships, but you look for sites that, that are kind of like blogs, basically doing this, scholar, this scholarship approach. You get those URLs. Then you can use a tool like Moe's, or RFs, basically any tool that's going to give you all the links to that site. Basically, you're kind of stalking the sites that are linking to those to those scholarship pages, right? To the scholarship listing on a commercial site, on a blog. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, you want to find other scholarship pages, right? You created your own scholarship page, but you don't have any links to it. Okay. So what, So we'll run Joe's scholarship page through the through this search, right? And find all yeah. the... Okay. 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 You find all the backlinks that go to my scholarship page because it's going to be all these .edu sites, these .gov sites that are linking to that page, gotcha. right? And, and these are all targets for your own scholarship. Okay. Is RFs, it's, so it's AHREFs, is that, is that a free tool or is that a paid tool? They've got a free trial okay. that I recommend because I think it's like $100 a month oh, is okay. the minimum for, for the paid but they all do free trials. Okay. So do do like one month where you do all your SEO stuff. Okay. And, and you use all the free trials on Moe's and Ara and Ahrefs and and all those other sites and just you know use their free trials. But get all your research done in a month. Okay. Sounds good. So yeah, you go to these these SEO tools and they'll give you all the backlinks pointing to this other scholarship page, and you can quickly get a list of, of two or three hundred EDU sites, just other websites that are linking back to these pages. And again, basically from there, it's just outreach. You do one email, a template email. You send it out to all of them that says, hey, you know, I've, I've got this great $500 annual scholarship that I'd like to, to let your students in on. Again, it's, it's a win-win. Their students are getting a scholarship opportunity. You're getting inbound links from sites that have a lot of domain authority. And so then the idea is that these colleges and universities post that on their blog or on their site, letting their students know. Yep. They're going to do a sentence or two about your scholarship. Within that, they're going to have a link back to your scholarship page. And like I said, you know, these links, they're, they're gold for Google okay. because they're high authoritative links. You get 40, 50 of them back to your scholarship page, and it's just going to help increase your domain authority. Fair enough. And it's a really easy process. So like I said, you know, I, I give away 500 bucks a year, but that gets me all these really great links plus a ton of content that people share, yeah. that people share for me. It's really a, a great process. That seems like probably not too difficult to make a positive ROI on for that. Plus, you know, you're helping, you're helping out. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, Hey, it's, it's for the kids, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So cynical. And Joe, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity here too. Do you have a write up on one of your sites where you kind of detail this process? I actually do on myworkfromhomemoney.com. There is, I kind of go through the three link building strategies that I like most. Uh, scholarships is, is one of those. Okay. In that new book, Google SEO for bloggers, I outline it. I detail it a little bit more, try to give the book buyers a little bit extra. Okay. But it's all in there. 
Fair enough. We'll, we'll, you let me know that link and we'll put that on the show notes for this episode. I want to give you an opportunity to do some internal page link building. This is what, cause one of my favorite tactics is going on other podcasts and telling stories from my guests and being like, well, you should have heard Rosemary talk about how to get traffic from Pinterest. We'll link, we'll link that up in the show notes for you, you know, and you kind of, you know, force the, force the host's hand almost in a way and saying, building these internal links, similar to guest posting, not just to your homepage, but to some specific content on your site. So I definitely like that one. Joe, thank you for joining me. This has been awesome. I definitely have some homework to do, and I know that's the mark of a good episode. So appreciate you joining me. The book is called Google SEO for Bloggers, and it's myworkfromhomemoney.com. And let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Oh, wow. Okay. So, you know, I really didn't, I prepared a tip, but it's more of a, another best strategy that I like using. All right. Well, lay, lay it on us. Okay. So something that no bloggers are doing but it's tripled my traffic for every, on average for every post that I do it. It's called republishing. And the idea is that, okay, after, you, after you've published a post, if you want to make changes to it, you can either update it or you can republish it. I know a lot of people, they'll just go in, they'll change some dates on, on a post, they'll add something, and then they'll just update it, okay. which, which basically keeps it at the same date in your blog, kind of buried somewhere in your blog's basement, right? Okay. Well, now republishing is actually giving you the chance to update it, improve the SEO power of that post. Because, you know, at this point, if a, a post is you know six months old or whatever, you can go into your Google Webmaster Tools, your search console, and you can actually see the keywords that it's actually ranking for. Maybe one of these keywords, maybe this one of these really great keywords it's ranking for wasn't your original intent. So you can actually go back through that post and opt, re-optimize it for this keyword, maybe boost it a little bit. You can also add content to make it stronger. And one of the best things, you can monetize it. Okay. So basically, you, you go back to this post, you add in affiliate links, you update it, maybe re-optimize it. And then instead of just hitting update, then you can actually change the date on when it was published. In your WordPress editor, it'll say published on January 9th, 2014 or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can actually click edit there change it. And what you want to do, you want to change it for, you know, two minutes into the future. So it's February 16th right now, 538. I would hit February 16th, 2017, 540. And then I would hit publish. And that would put that post at the front of my blog as basically as a new post. It would publish it at 540 p.m., so it would take it offline for like two minutes, basically. Yep. And basically you want to do that because you want to give WordPress time to republish it. But you don't want it inactive for too long because all those links that you've got going into that post from other sites are going to be broken, right? Okay. And if the post is inactive. So you don't want people to know that there's a broken link building opportunity here, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. If it's only inactive for two minutes, then you know nobody's going to catch it. It's going to come back online and, and all those links are gonna, still going to work. So it's going to have this ton of SEO juice, this Google power. But now you get another opportunity to send it through social media, the people that are just happening by your blog and, and are going to see that first post that you just published. They're going to see it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because not everyone has gone through your entire archive. Yeah. A lot of these posts that you have that are one or two years old, nobody's going to see them. Unless people are getting there from Google search directly to that post, nobody else is seeing those things. And this tripled your traffic? Oh, yeah. I actually, I tracked my traffic on the republished post for two months while I was doing it on two blogs. Okay. And I don't track it anymore because I could get a third of the, of the outcome and I would still do it. Basically, you know, it's 247% was the increase in, in Google search traffic to each post that I republished. Wow. And I was making more money on them. Do you think it's just because like this was in addition to the changes you made? Now we know that recency plays a role in the algorithm. So you kind of have, you've updated the publishing date. So this is now, it's fresher in their, in their mind. Yeah. It's a ton of different factors. I, I mean, you get that recency factor for Google. You get the opportunity to to maybe make it a little bit stronger as far as keywords. I usually add two, three hundred words, maybe a few paragraphs to it, okay, just to make make the content a little bit stronger. Maybe you go back and, and you add a video. Maybe you, you shoot a two minute video or an audio section or an infographic, okay, and you put all those in there. And it's just about really making this content even stronger. But you've still got all those links that you had before. So it's really like putting this post on steroids and it works great. 
Yeah, I've done this a ton for some of my other sites, not a ton on Side Hustle Nation, a little bit kind of last year during the kind of the site audit process, but all right. So, so you're looking for those yep. posts that are like, are we getting a little bit of traction? Maybe they're, you know, bottom of the first page at Google and, you know, how can we, how can we bump those up a little bit? Exactly. You look through your analytics, see, see the pages that maybe aren't getting the, the kind of traffic they used to or, or whatever. There is one caveat, obviously. You don't want to change that URL address, that website address to that page, because that's where all your links are pointing to. Okay. So if you have your date in your URL, don't... That's another one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. If you have the date in the URL, then you can't do it. You have to basically change your permalinks to where your date isn't in the URL. Yeah. Get the date out of there. You don't need that. You don't need that anyway. It's, it just makes up for a really long, clumsy URL anyway. Yeah. So yeah, you don't want to change your, your URL but it works great on so many different levels. Well, very cool, Joe. Yeah, it gives you an opportunity too to do some more internal linking. You revisit, well, oh, I've written five more articles that would be relevant to some of the content in here and you can internal link those to, you know, once you update that post. So this is great stuff, Joe. Thank you so much for joining me and we'll catch up with you soon. I appreciate it. Great time. Thank you. This edition of the Side Hustle Show is brought to you by FreshBooks.com. If you're trying to grow your side hustle into a full-time gig, that is awesome. Now, the trick is to make sure your pile of paperwork isn't growing as well. And that's where our friends at FreshBooks come in. They've created cloud accounting software for side hustlers, freelancers, and entrepreneurs like us who need to keep their admin and paperwork in check, but don't have a lot of time to do it. So like so many other things in life, timing is everything. And right now happens to be the perfect time to give FreshBooks a try. Now, why is that? FreshBooks has just launched an all-new version of their platform. It's been rebuilt from the ground up. So sending invoices, tracking your time, and managing your projects is now faster and more intuitive than ever. FreshBooks also understands that side hustlers don't sit still, and that's why their mobile app works wherever you do, and you can even snap pictures of receipts on your phone to make claiming your expenses about a million times easier. See how the all-new FreshBooks can save you time dealing with your paperwork so you can spend more time making your hustle happen. Visit freshbooks.com slash side hustle to start your 30-day free trial today. That's freshbooks.com slash side hustle to start your 30-day free trial. All right, my top takeaways from this chat with Joseph. Number one, do the extra 15 minutes. Do the research. It's, if a small tweak to your article title and structure can mean the difference between obscurity and extra hundreds of visitors a month, I think that's worth it. Like, Remember that the um, the 10th result on the, even on the first page of Google only gets 2% of the clicks. So if you're on page two or below, like nobody's going to find you. So I think we can use Joe's process to uncover those rankable keywords and get some qualified free traffic from Google. Uh, takeaway number two was to use guest posting strategically to link back to your most valuable posts. In in hindsight, this makes total sense, but for whatever reason, it never really crossed my mind. I was always just going for those homepage links, which, you know, as Joe pointed out, kind of a wasted opportunity there. Uh, takeaway number three was to pick one of these methods and give it a shot. When we talked about infographics, we talked about broken link building, scholarships, republishing, and they can all work, but I would tackle one at a time. For example, I'm going through some of my archive content and trying to see which ones might make good candidates for an infographic. That seems like a fun one to try. And as an aside here, I think a done for you scholarship link building service like you uh, described could be an excellent productized service offering. I mean, he laid out the the entire roadmap to get that done. And now all you've got to do is go find a client and uh, and execute on it for them. So I know we covered a lot in today's episode. So if you'd like to download a free PDF summary with all of Joseph's top tips, you can do so at sidehustlenation.com slash Joseph. And if you enjoyed this edition of the Side Hustle Show, be sure to hit the subscribe button in your podcast player app to make sure you never miss an episode. That's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show, where you'll meet an Amazon FBA seller who's done over $13 million in Amazon sales. And what's cool about this is we're not talking about retail or clearance arbitrage, and we're not talking private label. It's a totally new to me business model. I'm excited to share it with you next week. I'll see you then. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com.